Good afternoon and welcome to the Aspen Institute's McCloskey Speaker Series program. I'm so excited to see you all. This is such a celebration. It's uh, really a, a monumental moment uh, in all of our lives to be together again. Uh, I'm Crystal Logan, Vice President of Aspen Community Programs and Engagement, and I hope I saw a lot of you online and on our virtual programs. It's great to see you again in person. Um, we uh, first want to thank Tom and Bonnie McCloskey for supporting this program, and uh, I'm thrilled and honored to introduce our special guest today. Uh, Dr. Ashish Jha uh, is a recognized uh, global expert on pandemic preparedness and response, as well as on health policy research and practice. He has led groundbreaking research around Ebola and is now on the front lines of the COVID response. Dr. Jha has uh, published more than 200 original research publications in prestigious journals. He's extens extensively researched how to improve the quality and reduce the cost of healthcare. Uh, he is currently the Dean of the School of Public Health at Brown University and prior was a faculty member at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and Harvard Medical School since 2005. Amna Nawaz uh, joined PBS NewsHour in 2018 and serves as senior national correspondent. She has earned several honors, including a Peabody Award and an Emmy. Prior to joining NewsHour, she was an anchor and correspondent at ABC News, anchoring breaking coverage and leading the network's coverage of recent presidential elections. She has served as a foreign correspondent at NBC News, reporting from Pakistan, Afghanistan, Syria, Turkey, and the broader region, and was the founding editor of NBC's Asian American platform built to elevate the voices of America's fastest growing population. I'm honored to welcome you both here to the Aspen Institute and look forward to hearing your perspectives on this important topic. Thanks, and over to you, Amna. Thanks. Crystal, Crystal, thank you so, so much for that lovely introduction. Can everyone in the back hear me okay? Wonderful. Um, I am delighted to be here today, not just to be in Aspen, not just to be here with Dr. Zha, but also to be in person with all of you. So many of you, I know, got your fully, you got fully vaccinated, you took your negative COVID test to be here. I want to thank you for that. And also thank everyone who's watching as part of our online audience as well. We're going to be taking questions at the end. So keep in mind, if you don't hear something you'd like to know, you can throw it to us at the end of the conversation. Dr. Shah, thank you so much for being here today. How are you? I'm great, thank you. Um, and I just wanna also say, first of all, I wanna say it feels a little weird to be in a room with this many people. <laughs> and it feels lovely. Like, this is what we've all been waiting for. And it's taken us a long time. It's been a lot of work, a lot of science, a lot of logistics, a lot of other things have gone into it. Uh, but this is really an important moment to be able to come together in person, and I'm thrilled that we can do it. And, and a huge uh, thanks to the people who put this together and made this a safe environment. So I'm thrilled to join you and looking forward to our conversation. Here we go then. So the event is called uh, The State of Public Health in a Post-Pandemic World. I think we can all agree we're not in that post-pandemic world yet. So let's talk about where we are. Um, in the United States alone, over the last seven days, the U.S. has averaged over 19,400 new cases a day. That's almost a 50% increase from the previous week. So what is this summer surge that we're seeing across the country now? What does this surge tell you about where we are in the pandemic? Yeah, um, so we're in a, I think we're in a complicated moment in the pandemic, and let me explain. Um, on one hand, things are so much better. This event as testimony to how much progress we've made. About two-thirds of American adults have gotten at least one shot. Infection numbers are way down from where they were. And yet, even in, even in the US, and the global scene is very different, but even in the US, there's a sense that in the last few weeks that this incredible progress we were making has, has sort of flattened. And in fact, things are getting a little bit worse. So why is that? The main reason is the Delta variant the variant of the virus that is now widespread. Probably 90% of infections in the United States are from the Delta variant. 
and um, it is the most contagious version of the virus we have seen by far. And it is really wreaking havoc in people who are unvaccinated. And about a third of American adults haven't gotten a shot. Um, obviously, kids under 12 haven't gotten a shot. There are a lot of vulnerable people, and they're not randomly distributed, right? There are communities where there are very, very few people who've been vaccinated. And so what that means is that we have a lot of vulnerability left in our country. Um, there are going to be more variants because that is the nature of this virus, and we have learned that. And, you know, if you think about this Delta variant, start, variant started in India, the Alpha variant that was dominant here before then started in the UK, any place you have large outbreaks, you're going to have more variants. And so as long as things remain as challenging as they do globally, uh, we're all going to have to continue to, to struggle with this. So um, I don't think we should lose sight of the progress we've made, which is phenomenal. But we are certainly not in a post-pandemic world, not even in the United States, let alone the rest of the world. But to hear you say there are going to be more variants, we know there are these huge pockets across the country. I think there's something like a thousand counties where fewer than 30 percent of the population, of adult population, is vaccinated. If that kind of community is going to prolong the pandemic, is going to provide more opportunity for new variants. I, I recall when, you know, vaccinations were going up and everyone's saying we're emerging from a tunnel, we're moving into a post-pandemic world. Are we really, at least here in the U.S.? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, that I've been a little bit surprised at um, two things, both um, how hard it has been to get that last third of Americans vaccinated. We have uh, really hit a wall nationally. We're having a very hard time uh, accessing and, and helping people get vaccinated that last third. We can talk about why and what's really holding that group back. Um, but until they do, I don't think we can say we're rounding the corner, you know, end of the, uh, the light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, again, what we're going to see, I think, over the next six to 12 months is places that can do things like this, where we can start getting together with families and friends much more readily. Uh, but we're going to continue battling this pandemic until... 70, 80 percent of the entire population, probably more like 80 percent of the entire population, is vaccinated. And we're nowhere near that right now. So let's talk about some of the uh, reasons people give for not getting the vaccine, because it doesn't seem as if anyone has any one reason they're not doing it. When you hear about the headlines of the FDA issuing new warnings, for example, especially with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, a new one just this week, a lot of people I've talked to anecdotally in the field will say, oh yeah, you know, it's not close for me to get a vaccine, I heard that it could cause a blood clot, I feel fine, everyone in my family feels fine, it's sort of a mix of reasons. If the messengers aren't breaking through and the science, the message of science isn't breaking through, what will? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so what, when you look at that, again, that third of the U.S. population that isn't vaccinated and ask what's holding people back, uh, for some people it's still access. Now you may say, well, what does that mean, access? Everybody can get a vaccine anywhere they want. True, but for a lot of people, access isn't just can I go to my CVS or can I go to my uh, you know, health clinic and get it? It's, they've heard, a lot of you may have experienced, I experienced after my second shot, the next 24 hours was pretty miserable for me. Many of you might have had that. People have heard that. And some people think, oh, I can't take a day off of work. Who's gonna watch my kids during that time? So those are also access barriers. Um, in communities of color, um, what you have is longstanding challenges of trust with the health system. I think good, for good reasons, the health system has uh, often treated people very badly. And now, people are showing up and saying, I know we really haven't been there for you when you needed it, but how about a vaccine? And you're not going to be surprised if not everybody jumps for joy and says, yes, please. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done on trust. But a bigger portion of this is the misinformation that has been very well orchestrated. And when you look at what causes people to to, be, to pause and say, I don't know if I want it. The misinformation is not random. It's very well designed, it's well developed, it's targeted towards specific groups. Uh, we were talking just before we walked over that you know, a lot of it targets young women, for instance, around issues of fertility. It's total nonsense. There's no impact on fertility. But if you create the right kind of messages, you create just enough doubt that people think, eh, I think I'm gonna pass. And that has worked really well. So, there isn't going to be a single solution that's going to do this. But I think it's going to be a combination of mandates. Like, I, I think that's going to end up playing a role. Um, trusted voices in communities, 
right? It's one thing for me as a public health person to say people should get vaccinated, but it's somebody who lives in that community is trusted by a community standing up and saying people need to get vaccinated, I think that will help uh, a lot. And then I really do think we have to have better strategies for countering misinformation. Uh, we, in the public health community at least, I would say have been blindsided by the power of the misinformation, how well it's been organized, uh, how effective it has been. And you know, I had a mental model coming into this pandemic, and please don't laugh at me, but I really did. I used to believe that like, if you just get the science right and the evidence right, and you communicate it to people, it's good enough. <laughs> Turns out, nowhere close. And um, so we in public health have to go back and think about what else do we need to be doing and how do we communicate far more effectively um, in the world where these platforms like Facebook are really the major source of misinformation out there. Is that something, I'm curious, is that something it will take federal government action on to combat, the, the misinformation part of it specifically? Uh, you know, it's an interesting question, right? Because there's clearly federal efforts to regulate uh, these social media platforms. Um, there is some effort happening within the social media platforms themselves. Uh, so I've been talking to leadership at Google, at Twitter, um, who really say, look, we want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. We want to figure out how to do a better job. Um, but not all platforms have that approach. And there's one particular platform that has not had that approach. Um, you and know, you're I, going to tell us which one that is? I mean, Facebook basically sees, you know, it's interesting. We, at one point last year, I made, some, in some public event, I talked about how these platforms were killing us, that the misinformation was causing people to die. And someone caught that and basically reached out to Twitter, Facebook, Google, a couple others to say, let's get a group of people together to talk about this. And really senior people from all the different platforms showed up. And then the two people that, the, that Facebook sent were really junior, who had just arrived. I mean, it was just very clear, they don't care. And so until I think Facebook gets, ser gets serious about this, I have a lot of um, skepticism about how much progress we can make. I want to pick up on another thing you mentioned about um, the access issue, and specifically in communities of color, because one of the things that's baffled me in covering this pandemic for more than a year now is there were people early on, in the very earliest week, saying, we know who is going to be hit hardest. Yep. We know that it's going to be black and brown communities. We yep. know this is where we're going to have to help. And we didn't do it. Yep. And there are, as you say, a number of reasons. There's access, misinformation, and so on. But I wonder when you look at where the numbers are now, specifically for communities of color, what's not being done right now that could be done to help close those gaps? Yeah, so the, again, nationally, black Americans, Latinos, are much less likely to have been vaccinated than whites. And there too, I think there are two parts of it. One is there's a lot of misinformation specifically targeted towards those communities. So. Again, people who are creating the misinformation, they know what they're doing, and so they're, per then they're playing up issues of trust, right? And they know what kind of resonates in these communities. Um, but the other part, and, the, and one of the ways you counter it, is by finding trusted individuals. And so it's not just finding the doctors and nurses who are trusted, but the community organizations that have been there for years and working in those communities, we've got to actually find ways of uh, recruiting them into this effort. And, they're not just gonna say, sure, whatever you want. Like, you have to actually go spend time with people, explain to them why it's important, uh, help people get there. And that, it just takes work. And I don't know that we've done that work yet. So we're obviously talking a lot about the United States and what needs to happen here, what has happened here. You and I spoke a little bit about the fact that globally, we're, we're lagging, right? It's nowhere near where the vaccination rates should be. We know the richest countries have bought up most of the vaccine or administering them faster than any other nation. What else could the most rich among the, the countries in the world, the most powerful, the ones who are now sitting on surplus, what else could be done? And what does that timeline look like? I mean, in other words, if they were to start distributing faster, could we globally move out of the pandemic faster? Yeah. So let's just take a minute to kind of bring everybody up to speed on where we are with global vaccinations. Um, about 25% of the world has gotten one shot. You may look at that and say, that's not terrible. It's not, right? One out of four. Um, but very, very unevenly distributed. In Europe and North America, it's about 50%. Uh, in Asia, it's about 25%. Uh, mostly because China has been doing an extraordinary job on vaccinations. 
uh, with the Chinese vaccines. Uh, in Latin America, it's about 35% of people have gotten at least one shot. And in Africa, it's 3%. Right? So 35, 45, 25, 3. It's a huge, huge problem. It's also a huge problem even, uh, I mean, Asia is such a large, obviously, continent with so many people, 25% is wholly inadequate. Uh, I mean, we're talking about how 50% overall for the U.S. is inadequate. Um, but, but it's true, the U.S. and Europe are moving along, or I should say North America, it's Canada too, are moving along at a pretty good clip. And I think both in Europe and North America, the problem is no longer vaccine supply. It's about persuasion, getting people vaccinated, all the stuff we were talking about. What is the problem? The rest of it is just about production. So it's not a money problem. Like, you can't throw more money at this problem. It is a supply problem. And one way to think about it is, you know, the world did not have infrastructure to make 10 billion doses of vaccines in the years 2021, and 20 and 2021, right? That, that infrastructure didn't exist. So we are building plants. We are building all the raw materials and supplies. Um, I've been working pretty closely with people in India. The Serum Institute of India is the largest manufacturer of vaccines, not just for India, but really for the globe. And a couple of months ago, when India was in, in some of its worst days of its uh, second wave, speaking to the leadership of Serum, saying, like, what do you need? You know, they were running out of liner bags that go into the vats that you use to make. And there are only two companies in the world that make this liner bag. And it's a very specific, like you can't just take random liner bags, right? Like it's for vaccines. There are two companies that make this and both of those companies are going 24 seven. So you realize there are all of these problems that are slowing down the, the expansion of global vaccinations. So what do we do? First of all, we need to bring more manufacturing capacity in. And this is a place where I think US leadership can actually make a big difference. We need to bring in people who can make those liner bags. Maybe they never have, but they have the, cap the capability. Think of this as a little bit like when General Motors started making ventilators. General Motors doesn't generally make ventilators, but they can in a crisis, and they did. We need to do that kind of stuff. Um, second is we have to expand capacity of manufacturing on the African continent. You know, Africa is making almost none of its own vaccines. One of the reasons it has been able to vaccinate so few people is because when India gets into a crisis, it stops exporting its vaccines and says everything stays here. When Europe gets into a crisis, the, the standard answer is we gotta get to the Europeans first. The US did the same thing. Everybody goes to vaccine nationalism and says we have to vaccinate our own people. And the one continent that doesn't have manufacturing capacity, Africa, is left out. So I think we've got to start building on that now. Um, I've been speaking to colleagues uh, in the African Union at the Africa CDC. One of the points that they make is this will be the last pandemic where they're gonna rely on others to come help them. I think as we emerge from the pandemic, you're gonna see a very different Africa that is gonna be very focused on managing its own destiny. But in the short run, we're gonna have massive uh, excess supplies. Uh, my estimate is we're gonna have about five to 700 million extra doses by the end of this year. Um, maybe more, Europe as well. And we've got to start sharing them now and not wait till, uh, wait till the end of the year. So there's got to be a, a, a multi-pronged strategy to getting the world vaccinated. I think sometime probably in the first or second quarter of next year, we'll have enough vaccines for the world. But that's a lot of time between now and let's say next June. And if you think about all these variants that have come about in the last six months, do we really want to let this virus run wild for another nine to 12 months and see what happens. Like, I don't think anybody thinks that's a great strategy. So we've got to do a better job of getting more vaccines out. Is it fair to say then we are prolonging the pandemic by not sharing excess vaccines sooner? Absolutely. Um, I want to ask you about mandates. And specifically something I've seen in a number of states I've traveled across in recent weeks, which is a surprising uh, amount of reluctance or resistance to getting the vaccine among healthcare workers those who work in nursing care homes, uh, those who work in home as, as, as care staff. And one of the things I've seen is that, again, it's a number of different reasons that people are providing, and now you're seeing hospital systems, Texas, Georgia, other places, mandating all staff have to be vaccinated. Is that the only way forward? Should more healthcare systems, for example, be doing that now? Yeah, so there's a, um, I've been a bit on this for the last month. Um, publicly saying, I think it's unconscionable for health systems not to mandate that their employees be vaccinated. And here's why. Um, health systems take care of vulnerable people. 
by definition, right? They take care of older people, they take care of sicker people, they take care of immunocompromised people. And the idea that if you are, let's say you have cancer, you're getting chemotherapy, you go to the hospital, the person who comes in contact with you may be unvaccinated strikes me as just unacceptable. Like that is just not what we should be tolerating. Uh, you saw Houston Methodist in, in Houston uh, mandate this. People thought this was gonna be very, very difficult. 99% of their employees ended up getting vaccinated. And it was a very small number that left. I do think you're gonna see more health systems um, join this. It's sort of un untenable to have a healthcare system where a lot of unvaccinated employees are running around taking care of vulnerable patients. I think it's gonna change. It's just, it's gonna be slow because health systems are nervous that they're gonna get pushback and, you know, and, and politicians are gonna get angry. And, and so that's, I think, what's holding them back. But I think I wanna see a little more courage from uh, healthcare leaders. But if mandates seem to be the only way to break through that barrier of reluctance, hesitancy, whatever it is, do you think those mandates should be extended to other institutions? For example, all the many institutions we now know as essential, right? Should government, national security, transit, education, should there be more mandates to get us to that level of herd immunity faster? Well, the way I have thought about this is not so much that President Biden should come out and say there's a mandate. He can't and it wouldn't work, or governors. Um, but, you know, I work at a university. I, I'm at Brown. Our president decided to put in a mandate. If you want to work at Brown, if you're an employee, if you're a faculty, if you're a student, you need to be vaccinated. And her logic was really quite straightforward. She said, I want to, I want to get back to normal or some version of normal. Right? I want to have classrooms which are not socially distanced. I want to have dorms that are not uh, where you know, students can kind of experience what normal life at college is like. There's only one way to do that, which is to make sure everybody's vaccinated. There's one way we can do this, is that all of you are either vaccinated or you've tested negative today. This is how we get our lives back. What I think is going to happen is companies are going to realize, you want employees back? And by the way, this is not have them mask up and socially distance for the next three months. This virus isn't going to be gone in for three months. So you're asking, what kind of future do you want for the next five years? Do you want everybody masked up, socially distanced, in the office forever? If not, you probably have to do some sort of a mandate. So I think we're going to see a lot more mandates because there's no other easy way out of this. If you want to put the pandemic behind you, if you want to be able to have gatherings like this, if you want to be able to have a meeting of 10 people in a conference room, and not worry about, is that a safe thing to do? You gotta have a mandate. I wanna ask you about the public health system. Um, because if there's one thing the pandemic exposed, it's just how years and years of underfunding and kind of putting that to the side as a priority will catch up with you in the end. And everyone I spoke to on the state level, county level, local level said the same thing. We've had decades and decades of underfunding. Um, we've had a shortage of workers for I don't even know how many years. And now public health officials were left as the last line of defense in you know, our, our nation's most serious health crisis in generations. What is the state today, more than a year into the pandemic, what's the state of our public health system today? So it's not good, and it's not good, and, and let's talk about what has happened. So you may think, well, we spend so much money on healthcare, how could it be that we've been neglecting public health? We spend a lot of money on hospitals, right? We spend a lot of money on MRIs and CAT scans and pharmaceuticals. Um, we don't spend a lot of money having a really terrific public health laboratory system. We don't spend much money having a terrific public health workforce. And so when the pandemic hit, we couldn't stand up testing. If you remember February, March, April last year, nobody could get a test. That was a huge failure, largely because we had not invested in public health laboratory capacity. Once we started being able to get testing going, we couldn't do contact tracing. Because who was going to do it? We had no public health workforce. So, we found out, unfortunately, pretty quickly, the cost of having uh, under, sort of underinvested in our public health infrastructure, uh, you know, what happens in a pandemic. Now, fast forward a year, um, we've seen about half of public health leaders leave over the last year because it has been 18 hours a day, seven days a week of trying to manage this pandemic on a shoestring, not having enough staff. And then a lot of public health leaders have faced this barrage of personal attacks, critique, um, from people who, who think the pandemic is a hoax or overstated. So you've got leadership leaving, 
And, you know, and if you look at the infrastructure, here's one example. Um, if you think about all those positive, there were 19,000 infections yesterday. How, did that, how do we know that? They were reported up through state labs to the CDC. The way it happened in many, many counties and many places is somebody went and got a, uh, a test, a, a nose swab, came back positive. That was, that was basically entered into a local computer, printed out, and faxed over to the state lab, where somebody then typed it in and sent it off to the CDC. That, that's what happened yesterday, that's what's happening today. The public health system is single-handedly keeping the fax industry alive. <laughs> and I think if one thing needs to go away from the pandemic, many things need to go away from the pandemic, then we can all say fax industry may be, may be time. So I mean, it's just one example of how outdated out of sort of, you know, capacity and, and resources the public health system is. Um, many ways we're gonna have to kind of rebuild it from scratch. Well, I hear you saying it's not good today, right? Thousands of people have left those posts. We're, we are not yet through this pandemic. That politicization of, of these, these folks and their, and their work has also not gone away, is probably getting worse, we yep. can all agree. The Biden administration has proposed billions of dollars to pour into public health, hire new workers, you know, change the infrastructure. But do you see that happening right now? Because the other concern is as you move out of one crisis, the memories grow sort of much more weaker, right? Yep. And it's not a crisis anymore that needs fixing. Yeah, and I think this is going to be tricky. Um, so I do think, I mean, this crisis is so profound that... Uh, I think there are going to be really important changes that are going to come out of this. Um, I think we're going to have a much stronger, better IT system than what I just laid out with the fax machines. Uh, Rochelle Walensky, who's the head of the CDC, has been talking about this for a long time, and I think you're going to see the CDC work with states to substantially ramp up and fix the IT infrastructure. I think we're going to hire more people. Um, you're, you're going to see a lot more interest among students who want to go into public health. Uh, this year, we saw across the country about a 25% increase in applications to public health schools. At our public health school, we have had, had over a 100% increase in applications. Just people are excited to go into public health. So I think all of that is great. The challenge is going to be, you know, so public health at the end of the day is still going to be small dollars compared to the behemoth that is our healthcare system. Our healthcare system is three and a half trillion dollars of spending. One of the things we're going to want to think about is how do we rely on the healthcare delivery system more to pick up the slack in a crisis? How do you mobilize those forces, those resources? We're never going to spend trillions of dollars in public health. That's just not going to happen. And I'm not sure we need to, but we need to do a much better job using the investments we have in other parts of our healthcare to back up public health when there is a crisis. What did we do better during the pandemic? We had to change everything about how we worked and how we lived, and, and the healthcare system yeah. had to flex and change too. Are there ideas that emerged over this last year plus of crisis that you think we need to hang on to moving forward? Absolutely, I mean, there's so many successes of the last year. I mean, it's hard to sort of realize because of kind of the visible, you know, the failures are very visible, right? Um, so just talking about the healthcare system, the ability of the healthcare system to pivot to telemedicine, for instance. And telemedicine is just one of the ways in which we realize there are a lot of things that we used to force people to come in and see a doctor that actually, it works just fine online. Not everything, but a lot of things. I think some of those things we're gonna keep. I, I think for me, and I, I, you know, I, I just am really struck by the way science moved in the past year. The way that we were able to build all of these incredibly effective and safe vaccines in such short order, it didn't happen randomly. Um, the amount of collaboration that was going on among scientists uh, is really breathtaking. I've never seen anything like this. I was you know, involved in a lot of these kind of uh, listservs and chat boards. Scientists were just literally, they would run experiments, get results, and share it with 300, 300 other scientists. It's not how we usually work. And so the flow of information was unbelievable. And I think that's going to change the way science works. It's going to be so much more collaborative. We're going to be able to solve problems much more quickly. Um, so science, I think, has seen some big bumps. I think we're going to see real improvements in healthcare. I even think about you know, online learning and education. No one thinks Zoom is a great way to teach people. But I think we've learned that actually some parts of education can happen online. Not everything has to happen in person. And that, in fact, there's some hybrid probably that's a much more optimal 
than what we used to do before. So we have an opportunity, I think, as we emerge from the pandemic, to think about all sorts of new ways of doing things. With all the focus on the virus and the new variant now, there have to be things we're missing. You think about our healthcare system, life has gone on, people are getting sick, people have postponed other treatment, other regular vaccinations. What are you worried that we've missed over the last year plus? And could one of those things lead to the next big health crisis? Yeah, there's a bunch of things. Number one on my mind, number one, two, and three is mental health mm -hmm. and the mental health effects of this pandemic um, and how much that's sort of gotten suppressed and buried. And the way I think about it is, um, you know, when you're in the middle of a crisis, you can suppress things. If you think about, you know, if you've been in an accident, for the first few hours, you're kind of in a crisis mode and you feel fine. It's when you wake up the next morning, you realize just how incredibly sore you are, all the things that hurt that you hadn't been paying attention to. Um, we're in that acute moment where we're just not paying attention to all the things that have happened. I think as we emerge from the pandemic, we're gonna realize uh, mental health issues in kids, but also adults, anxiety, depression, the little bit of data that's out there suggests that it has skyrocketed and we don't really have a good strategy for managing it. There's a whole bunch of regular health services. I do think, I mean, not just in the US, but around the globe, the number of just regular vaccinations that kids have missed, um, all the preventive stuff, mammograms, colon colonoscopies, um, the, you know, the care for cardiovascular disease. We have been neglecting all of it because we've been in a crisis. And it makes sense. When you're in a crisis, you just need to try to get through the crisis. But those issues haven't gone away. And I think we're gonna discover over the next year, year and a half, just how many things we missed. What all the collateral damage was of the pandemic. I wanna follow up on mental health though, because I think it's fair to say there was a crisis in America pre-pandemic. Correct when it comes to mental health. And when you see where the money is going, where the funds are being distributed, where the focus is, something like telehealth, for example, you think would be incredibly instrumental and helpful in addressing more people who have mental health needs. Are you seeing now any of those steps being put into place or not yet? A little, like a little. We're starting to see some more uh, telepsychiatry, tele, uh, again, mental health services, but not enough. And one of the major problems we had, again, before the pandemic, but certainly coming out of the pandemic, is we just don't have enough mental health providers, right? The number of psychiatrists, social workers, psychologists, people who provide these services is tiny compared to what we need. And it's sort of funny, because you say, well, why? Why do we have so few? It's not a random fact, right? It's not like there's a God-given fact that you'll never have enough mental health providers. It's the way our payment systems are designed we underpay for mental health services. We don't treat it as a regular part of healthcare. We even in insurance carve it out to like some other company. And that means that we don't pay enough for it, so not enough people go into it, and then we find ourselves with this mismatch between the needs of our population and the number of people who can do it. I think technology is gonna help with that, but at the end of the day, we just need a lot more people uh, to provide those services. So one of the other things we've talked about a lot is how the last year really laid bare the deep fissures in our society and certainly most blatantly along racial lines in America. And when you look at the way systemic racism has infiltrated every American institution, I think it's fair to say public health is, is counted among those institutions, Absolutely. right? So when you see some of the ways we are moving through, I won't say out yet, but through this pandemic, I'm wondering if you're seeing the changes being made in public health that will help to close some of those gaps and then also make sure that they don't persist in whatever the next pandemic is. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm just at the, again, because we're still in the middle of the pandemic, I think we're starting to see some early signs of things that give me hope. Um, but well, let me say two things on this. I mean, one is let's think about what the pandemic revealed. Why were communities of color so disproportionately affected? It was, you know, if you think about who was getting infected in the early days, and even it was essential workers. It was people living in multi-generational housing, right? The essential worker would go to work, get infected. Maybe there was a, they were a young person. They'd come home. They were living with their mother and grandmother. And all of a sudden, the whole household was infected. And it was the mother and the grandmother who would then get very sick. Um, so housing policy, work policy, uh, all of that contributed in very substantial ways. And 
I think what gives me hope is in the past, we used to look at those things and think, boy, they're really deep-seated, which they are, and they felt unmovable in some ways. They felt like our society had these deep entrenched problems that we just didn't know how to fix. And right now there's a moment, and this happens actually in pandemics, as societies emerge from pandemics, there's a moment to re-examine what is really entrenched and unmovable and what is not. And what I hear now more and more in conversations is we have to address housing policy because it's a public health problem, right? We have to address um, you know, where healthcare providers are set up, where clinics are placed. We, we haven't thought about those things, we haven't dealt with them, and the cost of not having dealt with them, I think, became really obvious in this pandemic. So I'm more hopeful than ever that we're gonna make progress on these issues, um, because I think too many people think it's unacceptable not to. As you mentioned at the top of this conversation, we are sitting in a room full of people, which is a strange sensation and also wonderful yep. in a lot of ways, but everyone went through the steps, right? They got fully vaccinated, they took a negative COVID test. France, we saw just today, has new mandates in place for health workers and is also requiring either a negative COVID test uh, or to be fully vaccinated to enter restaurants and cultural venues. Is that how we move out of this, step by step, institution by institution, rule by rule? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think um, it's gonna be hard here in the United States because there's so much opposition to mandates, to vaccine passports or vaccine verification systems. And, um, and I don't think it's gonna be coming from government, right? So this is where I said, I don't think I see President Biden doing anything. Even governors are gonna struggle because they're gonna get a lot of pushback if they try to put in these kinds of things. New York has, Governor Cuomo has uh, tried and has gotten a lot of pushback and it sort of works okay in New York. Um, but what you're gonna see is individual businesses, right? Like the folks who organized this event. They said, we wanna create a safe environment, this is how we're gonna do it. And more and more businesses Theaters, movie theaters, uh, shows, concerts are going to say, we don't want to be sources of, of super spreading events, and so we are going to require this. And the more that happens, actually, that's essentially what happened in Israel. One of the reasons why Israel moved so quickly to vaccinating 80, 85% of its adults is because they created a passport system, and companies started using it, and people didn't want to miss out. And so they... So even though they felt like maybe they don't need the vaccine, they were happy to get it if it meant that they could do things they weren't gonna be able to do otherwise. I wanna ask one last question and then I'd love to open it up for questions from the audience here and from our online audience as well. Um, this idea of two Americas we hear a lot about. We spoke earlier about the many, many communities in which there are very low vaccination rates, the existing hesitancy or reluctance, the misinformation that, that we're fighting against in many cases that's not gonna change anytime soon. And all of those are combined or prolonging the pandemic. As we move forward as a country through this pandemic, do you agree with this assessment that that's basically what we're going to have is, is one part of America or some parts of America where life is starting to open up, people are starting to gather, you can go into a restaurant unmasked and other parts where you're still very much dealing with severe consequences of COVID? I worry that that is where we're heading. Um, I mean, right now, you, places are open more or less everywhere, but you have places with very large surges happening. And at some point, as hospitals fill up, as people get sick, they're gonna have no choice but to pull back. And then you're really gonna see this contrast between places with high vaccination rates where they can do things like this safely and other places where it's a real struggle and people are getting sick. Um, I, I worry that's where we are gonna be in the short run. My hope, of course, is that that inspires more people to get vaccinated, that that creates an opening for people who have thought, eh, I don't really need the vaccine, or this is overstated, to once again look at vaccinations as their way back to the life that they really want. Um, so I remain hopeful that we're gonna be able to get past those barriers. But I do worry um, that some of the misinformation is so deeply seeded now uh, that you're going to see really a lot of suffering in a lot of communities across America in the next three to six months. And obviously, none of us want that. I would love to open it up to questions from the audience. And I see a lot of hands going up as we expected. Everyone's so excited to be back in person. I know. I think we have microphones being passed around. The first one's over here. 
Um, why don't we go to this gentleman in the back right there? Right in that row, yes. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Um, so it's pretty clear what the risk factors are for a bad outcome in unvaccinated people with COVID. My question has to do with fully vaccinated people who then go on to develop a Delta variant. Is there any data to suggest that the risk factors in that group are the same or different? It's a very good question. And I think there's a little bit of data and it's probably gonna be the same. It's probably gonna be older people, people with chronic diseases, or people who are gonna be more at risk of having a bad outcome if you have a breakthrough infection. So you're talking about the idea of fully vaccinated person has a breakthrough infection. The, the good news about breakthrough infections is they can be a little bit miserable, but most people do very, very well. Um, the rates of hospitalizations and deaths among people who are fully vaccinated is exceedingly low, but it's not zero. And if you ask, well, who does end up getting sick enough to be hospitalized or, uh, God forbid, dying? Uh, first of all, it's very, very small numbers, but they tend to be people with a similar risk profile of uh, who did badly with the, with the unvaccinated status. Let me go over to this side of the room. Whoever is closest to you, there you go. Yes. Hi, thank you. It seems that public health has done really well in communicating things like wash your hands, wear a mask, et cetera. But it's no longer the days of the polio vaccine. What has public health learned about communicating these days in a new way to help people do behaviors that are better for not just themselves, but community? What, what's the new way that public health has or should be focused on communicating? Yeah, it's a great question. I would not say that we have, that public health has figured out the new way. I think one of the things that we have learned, again, I, I told you my mental model from a couple of years ago of just figure out the science, tell people it'll be fine. Clearly not true. Um, I, I think one of the things we've learned are uh, that there is no one way to communicate with the American people. Some people get their information through social media. Other people still get it through newspapers. Some people get it through uh, trusted voices and groups. You know, there, there are people who get most of their information through WhatsApp groups. And, um, and so we, in public health, have to have a far more multifaceted approach to communicating. There's no sort of one size, like figure it out, go tell people on CNN and everything will be fine. It is figure out how to meet people where they are, communicate in the medium that they communicate in, and share information. Because if you don't, other people will. And this is what I have been saying to public health people. Uh, I have been on social media from before the pandemic, but a lot during the pandemic. And a lot of people think it's really strange. Like, why are you on social media? Why are you tweeting? And this is where a lot of people get their information. And if the goal of public health is to communicate with the public, then you got to figure out where does the public get its information and do that. Let's come back over to this side of the room. Uh, yes, gentleman right there. Dr. Jha, you indicated several times that solutions uh, depend on vaccines or negative COVID tests. I don't understand the value of the negative COVID test. It's transitory. Five days later, it's irrelevant, isn't it? Absolutely. So um, you're, uh, and you know, I'm gonna, for people who are here who got a negative COVID test, that negative COVID test does not mean I'm gonna feel comfortable hanging out with you a week from now. But I am gonna feel comfortable hanging out with you right now. And so negative COVID tests, actually negative COVID tests have multiple things of value. But for events like this are very valuable because we, we have people together for a short period of time and we can say with a high degree of confidence during this time, you are not contagious. That's great. Tells me nothing about what you'll be like three days from now or five days from now. Um, but if we had widespread testing available, there's very good data that if we had it and deployed it, we just keep infection numbers much, much lower. Because if you can help somebody with, in the earliest moments of a symptom get a test and find out that they're negative, they're gonna spend a lot less time spreading it to other people. And so as a public health measure, it's also a very, very powerful tool. But you're absolutely right. A single negative test doesn't buy you out of all the other, um, all the other challenges. And, and we saw that, by the way, in the White House last year, the outbreak in the White House. Everybody who walked into the White House grounds had a negative test. And yet the president got infected, large numbers of people got infected at the White House. Uh, it just tells you that that alone isn't gonna get you there. 
Let's go back over to this side. Yes, the gentleman in the blue. Hi, uh, Dr. Jar, thank you very much for being a source of um, accurate and relevant information over the past year. Um, that's been a, a great source of comfort. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you about the, uh, the recent controversy or discussions around boosters. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, it's just another step in a little bit of confusion, so I'd like to get your view on that. Sure. And I will say, if we were doing this a week ago, I would have given you a slightly different answer. Because, and this, by the way, is a truism of the whole pandemic, right? New science comes in, new data comes in. Uh, and by the way, just as a random side point, people who uh, like to beat up on public health folks use this as say, well, last week you said this, this week you say this. Yeah, like evidence changes. You want me to change my views when new science and new evidence comes in. You don't want me to be giving you the same advice I would have given last July, right? So here's what we know about boosters. Um, there is a little bit of data, and it's really very preliminary, from Israel, because they've done such a good job of vaccinating people, that um, older people and people with, uh, who are immunocompromised are starting to have a few more breakthrough infections um, with the Delta variant once they're more than six months out of their second shot. A lot more, we don't know. And how robust is that data? Not so robust. Um, I've talked to both Pfizer and Moderna leadership, and they say they have internal data. And my general take is internal data is great. Can you make it external data, please? <laughs> right? Like, share it with the world. Like, this is not a national security interest here. Like, share it with people. Let people pour over it. What I suspect is going to happen, and I suspect this, I just don't have the, the data yet, is we're going to find that some people have a waning uh, antibody level. And let me give you like just a quick overview of how to think about immunity and antibodies. Because this is very confusing and lots of people will throw out lots of information. T cells, memory B cells, what about those? Don't they matter? So think of your immune system as having like the active force and then the reserves. And the active force is the antibodies you have. And they prevent you from getting infected. And then you have your reserves, memory B cells and T cells. And what happens is if your antibodies wane, you might get a breakthrough infection. But then your memory B cells and your T cells show up and clean things up, and you don't get very sick. So I am confident that if the goal is to prevent hospitalizations and deaths, we're not going to need boosters. But if the goal is to prevent breakthrough infections, for some portion of people, not everybody, but for some portion of people, we might, and we just gotta see the data. It does raise an, another important question, and this is gonna come up, is in a world where, I told you 75% of the world hasn't gotten their first shot, and 90% of the, of the world uh, hasn't gotten their second, or at least you know, first or second, is that, do we wanna be doing a whole lot of third shots? Wouldn't the world be better off? Wouldn't we all be better off? if we got the world vaccinated? And the answer is yeah, like the world will be better off if we, because the last thing we need is more variants, the last thing we need is more challenges. So these are gonna be complex policy discussions. My general take is we should have them openly, honestly, we should understand trade-offs, we should all look at the same data and then make decisions together as a, as a group. Let's come back over to this side. Uh, all the way in the back there, yes. Thank you for taking my question. Um, everything I know is about the U.S., and so for you to tell me that 3% of Africa has been inoculated is surprising. As a social scientist, we're looking at a wonderful natural experiment. Can you tell me preliminarily what is the impact of not vaccinating? In other words, is everybody in Africa on the way to death? No, and, and remember, um, there are a couple of things. I mean, Africa has a couple of advantages. The biggest one in this context is it has a relatively younger population. And that is going to help. Um, but what we're going to see, and we're already seeing it in, in several African countries. We saw it in India. We're seeing it um, in other places. We're seeing it in Indonesia right now. Indonesia is suffering through a horrible outbreak in the last two weeks. Um, with no sense that it's about to abate. 
Um, what we're going to see in these places is lots of people get sick, lots of people die. Um, of course, most people will recover, right? Because uh, even under the worst of circumstances, the, the fatality rate is between half and 1% and maybe half percent. Uh, maybe a little higher for Delta, we don't know. But just recovery is not in, uh, enough because there are a lot of people who are going to end up having long-term complications of the virus. And so the impact on the African continent is going to be felt for generations. And the other part that's really important that I think has been a source of a lot of frustration, and I've been kind of trying to beat the drum on this, is there are about 50 million frontline healthcare workers in the world. And a vast majority of them are still not vaccinated. And the problem with that, I mean, so you say, well, look, healthcare workers are important, but there are a lot of important people, a lot of essential workers, and that's true. But there are two reasons why healthcare workers should be at the front of the line. One is where everybody else can keep themselves away from COVID, healthcare workers literally go to patients who have COVID, right? Like that's what they're taking care of. So they're particularly high risk. And the second is when healthcare workers get sick and die, those health systems can't take, of, take care of people with anything else. They can't take care of people with heart disease and diabetes and cancer. And so the health effects are massive. And um, so I had been calling on the Biden administration to basically say, we're gonna just vaccinate all the healthcare workers in the world as a, as a first step. They've made some progress on this, but not enough. We have time for one last question. Let's go to this side of the room. And yes, happily waving your hand in the back. We'll go to you. My question is about FDA approval of the vaccines. What's taking so long? When do you think it'll happen? And when uh, the vaccines are approved by the FDA, do you think that a lot of the holdouts will get vaccinated? Yeah, um, you guys are asking all the questions that I've been banging on about for. So I, I have a lot of friends who are senior people in the FDA. And let me just say, I've gotten some uncomfortable phone calls and text messages from people saying, why are you being uh, such a pain about this? I'm being a little bit of a pain about this. I think it's time the FDA approved uh, these vaccines. So let me explain why I feel very clear that it's time for an FDA approval. Then I can talk about what I think is slowing things down. So it made total sense back in December to, to authorize these vaccines. I'm thinking about Pfizer and Moderna particularly, not J&J, &J, which came a little later, um, under emergency use. We didn't have that much data. We had, you know, we, I mean, we had clinical trials of 30, 40,000 people, but only about two months of follow-up. And it made sense to, at that moment to emergency use authorization. At this point, we have data on 150, 60 million people in the US, several hundred million around the world. We have between six and 12 months of follow-up. You never have this much data by the time you go approving for things. Like, there's not, no drug that I can think of and no vaccine that has been now given to this many people before it's been fully approved. The FDA has all the data it needs. So then the question is, what's the holdup? Typically, full approvals take four to six months. They, there's a lot of box checking and a lot of things, and they go to, they go to uh, the factories and make sure that the production is going well, and they do a lot of quality checks. Those have all been happening. My take is I don't want them to cut any corners, but there's a lot of administrative stuff that takes many, many steps. I think those things can be sped up. I, I, I think the FDA should do this. You know, I, when is it actually going to happen? There are people who are in the know who say, it might happen really soon. And there are other people who say it won't happen until the fall or winter. Of course, I think like, that would be ridiculous. I would like it sooner than And the reason I think it's important for two reasons. There's a small number of people who I think will jump off the fence, who say, emergency use, I'm going to wait. But I don't think that's going to be the biggest benefit. I think the biggest benefit is it's going to give companies, businesses, schools a lot more comfort in requiring vaccinations. Right now, a lot of places feel like, while it's still under emergency use, they don't feel like they can compel people to get vaccinated. Once it's fully approved by the FDA, I think they will feel a whole lot better doing it. And I do think it'll end up making a big difference. So I'm hopeful it happens sooner rather than later. Um, I may have lost a few friends at the FDA through, this, uh, <laughs> through my advocacy, but I, I just think I don't want them to cut corners. Um, I don't want the White House to be pressuring them. I want the FDA to look at the data and if they agree with what many of us in public health feel, that the data's in and it's clear these things require full approval, then I think they should approve it. Dr. Ashish Jha, everyone.
Uh, if you don't mind, uh, moderator's privilege, I'm going to ask one last question here yeah. because this is something I've always wondered about you. You and I have spoken a number of times over the last year plus. We spent the last hour laying out the many challenges that still exist, and yet you did use the word hopeful. I am. Earlier on. Mm -hmm. And I wonder why. Yeah, I am incredibly hopeful. And let me lay out why. You know, one of the questions I get asked less now, but certainly I did all of last year, was people would say, when do we go back to normal? And I always asked, what do you mean normal? And what they meant was 2019, right? Life before the pandemic. And I would say, if you mean 2019, we're never going back to normal. But two things. First, there's no reason to think 2019 was the most glorious year of human history. <laughs> and we're forever gonna pine after, but in 2019, no. And the point of that was that pandemics change societies. They always have. You can look back to every major pandemic, every major health crisis, and five, 10 years later, that society has changed. The world has changed. And so there is an opportunity here because the world will change because of this pandemic. And how it will change is completely up to us. That's not written. The world could become more narrow and more walled off and we're, everybody's gonna become more nationalistic. Or we can realize that the reason we were able to build these vaccines with as much speed as we did is because a Hungarian scientist had worked for 20 years on building the mRNA technology that a group of Turkish immigrants in Germany translated into a vaccine that then an American company manufactured and many of you have gotten the Pfizer vaccine. That's how global science works. We can decide that's our model, or we can decide the model is everybody for themselves, every country for themselves, we're gonna do this all for ourselves and look out for number one. You all know which one I want. <laughs> but that's not, that's not a given. So I am hopeful because there are these deep-seated problems. I mean, even thinking about systemic racism, which has been with us forever, um, felt like we couldn't move the needle on a lot of these things. I don't know. The conversations have gotten much more frank, much more open, and a lot more interest in movement. So pandemics change societies. How they change societies is up to us. And I feel like, really, we have a lot of opportunity here to address longstanding challenges and build a world that we're all going to be a lot more proud of. And that's what makes me hopeful. I can't think of a better note to end on. Dr. Ashish Shah, thank you so thank much you. for your time. It's so good to speak to you face to face instead of screen to screen. I know. Thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who took the steps to safely be here today in person. And thank you to everyone in the online audience as well. Thank you, of course, to the Aspen Institute for hosting us. It was my thank pleasure. You.